Um, can everyone see my screen share? Looks yep. good, man. Looks good. Um, sorry, I'm just trying to do it so I can see your faces. Uh, right, so um, Topper Theory is a really deep and fascinating part of maths. So it's it kind of is like a blend between logic and geometry, if that makes sense. Um, it has a lot of applications, um, uh, and the, the kind of the, the most famous book about it is called The Elephant. And the the i the idea is it's the old fable about uh, Indian fable about an elephant. So there's three blind men that are us. You know, they know what they felt elephants and, and they say, Do you know what an elephant is? And one says, Yes, it's a kind of really big tree. And the other one says, because he's only felt the, the leg, and the other one says, It's a it's an enormous it's it's like a wall. And the, the other one says, um, it's like a rope. Um so yeah, Topaz theory is a bit the same. It's really hard to get an all encompassing view on it because there's many different avenues to approach it. Um so I'm going to take one tiny, tiny piece of topos theory and, and try and explain it. Um, yeah, so this is my, is my hobby learning this, so I'm not an expert. But, um, okay, let's get started. So uh, we just need to start off with a bit of, this is category theory, so we need to have a bit of refresher what categories are. So categories have objects. They have arrows that go between the objects. Uh, we can compose arrows. Um, and that's associative. So if we're composing three arrows, we don't need to bracket which way we're doing it. Um, and every object has an identity arrow, and that obviously is an identity for composition. Good. So everyone's favorite example is the category set. Um, so objects are sets and arrows are, are functions. So it might be from the natural numbers to the Booleans, that is the function is, is this a prime? Um, but yeah, whatever, you, whatever function you can think of. So this category has what's called an initial object. So no matter what x is, there's precisely one function from the empty set to x. Um, so this is what we call absurd in Haskell. Um, just there's no definition, so there's one function. Um, we also have what's called a terminal object. So any one point set. Um, so no, no matter what x is, there's, there's going to be one function, which is just const that thing. Um, so traditionally, you, when there's one of something, you just put star. Um, cool. And so we no, notate that zero and this one. Uh, so what's a point? So sets have elements, but I'm using the word point for a, a, an arrow from the terminal object, that's one into another object. So here we have a point of the set, one, two, three, four. Um, so it takes that single object, single element star to the element three. So we might as well say this is the point three of the set one, two, three, four. So in this case, points and elements are pretty much the same thing, but that won't always be the case. Um, so we have a, lots of structure in the category of sets. So we have we can add two sets, so this is like the disjoint union. So you see here, even though both the thing on the left and the, on the right have a C, they don't clash, so we end up with two copies. Um, so, so in Haskell, this is your either, and, and this would be left A, left B, left C, right C, right D. Um, so that sums are, uh, we have products, that's just your, your old ordered pairs. Uh, I see some puzzled faces. Uh, yeah, so feel free to interrupt if if, if there are questions. Um, hey, Mark, just checking on the previous slide. Um, is that second set supposed to be uh, zero one instead of CD? Uh, or am I misunderstanding. No, let's can't see you talk about. So what what's happening is. We're, we're getting the union of these, but we're adding on a second tag so that we know which set it came from. So this is just ABC again, um, but there's that comma zero. 
So in, in Haskell, there wouldn't be a comma zero. That would be, that would be left A, left B, left C. All right, thanks. Yeah. Um, can you just go back to the difference between the, the point and the element, which was, I think, a slide back? So the, the idea is the terminal object, in this case, just has one thing in, in it. So a function is, it has to send that one thing to one thing. So it's kind of pointing out one of the elements. So, so there's four possible points here. So I could choose to, to go to one, two, three, or four. And there'd be four functions that do that? There's four separate functions that go from star to one, star to two, star to three, star to four? Yeah. Cool. And so a point is defined, well, multiple points may, might be defined for each object in a category. Yes. Okay. Uh, in different categories, you, you have, uh, there might be objects that have no points, um, but they're not the same as the initial object. So just because things are this way in set doesn't mean they're like that in all categories. Um, are points always defined as arrows from the terminal object, or is that just a convenient one to use in set? Uh, no, that's that's so that's the definition. So what we're trying to do is, yeah, get. So we started with this intuition of it. It's a, it's an it's a way of talking about elements without talking about elements. So because elements are a set theory thing. Uh, that arrows belong to category theory. So we can say, oh, arrow from the terminal object to another object is a point of that object. Um, can you sort of ex expand on why that's the appropriate generalization? Yeah. Because um, it works in set. That's probably a, a good as answer as any. Um, so the notion of a terminal object is pretty, it's pretty general. And so lots of categories will have a terminal object. Um, in practice, it tends to be um, a uh, a good notion. Um, there will be a notion. What about? I was just going to say maybe what about counterexamples in sets like thing? If you're working the category of sets and you're thinking, okay, we don't want to do point using arrows this way. Here's some other way we thought we might try it, and it doesn't work. Um, you can you can sort of come up with an encounter example that you might intuitively think like this is a way that you could try to do it within the category of set to replicate set elements, but it doesn't work that way, and therefore it's not the right thing to generalize. Just uh, a thought. Yeah. So at the end of the talk, we'll have some more ingredients. We might be able to address that a bit. Um, cool. Uh, yeah. At this stage, that's kind of yeah. We, this is just to motivate things later on. So we just need this concept. It's not, yeah. Um, we'll come back to that later then. See if we can do something about it. Cool. No worries. Okay. Uh, so we're okay, then I'll, I'll, I'll carry on. So, um, so here we have a, a weird mathematician notation. So instead of saying, like in Haskell, we'd, we'd say the functions from X to Y is X arrow Y, but the mathematicians, like to write them in this power um, notation. So, yeah, so here we're just pointing out that the functions from X to Y is itself a set, when X is a set and Y is a set. Um, similar to how in Haskell we have that arrow, uh, X arrow Y is a type. Um, so we're kind of, um, we're inside the, we stay within the category when we do this. So, uh, this is what people when they when they say the category is closed, particularly Cartesian closed. This is, this is what they mean. They just mean functions are an object of your category, or sorry, morphisms. Um, so in this case, functions. Um, the good thing about this notation is, if y has y elements and x has x elements, then number of elements in y to the x is y to the x. So kind of makes sense. Okay, um, but sets are more than have special features that other categories don't have. So we have subsets. So we can say, you know, B, C is a subset of A, B, C, C, D. Um, and we actually get like a, a lattice of subsets. So we have like a top element, which is the full set that you're considering. We have a bottom element, that's the empty set. 
Um, we can intersect any, any two of these. Um, so A, B intersect B, C, they intersect in B. Uh, their union is in A, B, C. Um, so this is a kind of algebra of subsets. Um, and also the, all of the subsets together, they form a set. So once again, we have a kind of closure property. Um, so here we usually use like a curly P for that. So that's called the power set. Right. Um, okay, so another way we can talk about subsets is with predicates. Um, so for each element you say, is it in or is it not in? Um, so, uh, another word for that is a characteristic function, but it's just the same thing as a predicate. So, if we've got some set A, uh, so some set X, uh, and a subset A, we can alternatively describe this with a function, the, the characteristic set of A, which, which goes from X to bool. So, if N was the natural numbers and my set was uh, the even numbers, then this character fun characteristic function is going to go through like zero, yes, one, no, two, yes, three, no, and so on forever. Um, and so here we, here we have it, just another notation for that. So we can say A is the set of X in A such that the characteristic function applies to A applied to x gives true. Um, so the, in other words, the even numbers are the set of natural numbers that are even. That's, that's all we're saying. Um, so yeah, and here we just have a, the mathematician note, note, notion. So we have a, a special element in bool, which is true. So if that has some kind of special behavior because we can talk about subsets by saying they're the the set of things that are mapped to true. So once again, I'm just saying the same thing again. So the evens are the set of thing, the set of things that map to true under the function is even. Cool. Are we good? So another way to way you, way you can think about this is it's like a menu. So you go to the the set restaurant um which uh offers to serve you a part of yourself um and this menu has two items it's uh true false so you know chef recommends true if you're on a diet maybe you prefer false um and so what, what does that mean so if i'm if i come in and i'm a one element set i have a choice one choice true or false if i'm the natural numbers um I get. I actually have to make an infinite number of choices. So if I'm ordering the primes, you know, then zero says no, one says no, two says yes, three says yes, four says no, and so on. Okay. Uh, speak up if you have any questions. Um, so what's what's interesting is that the Bool kind of lives in the world of logic. Um, and these operations on sets, I'm, I'm going to call that geometry in a loose sense, but um, we have these kind of operations on sets and they, they mirror each other. So to you get the union of A or B, uh, union of A and B, what I'm doing is, is I'm ordering together the characteristic functions because there's got to be in A or in B. And for the intersection, it's got to be in A and in B. The empty set corresponds to the, the characteristic function that says no to everything. And the full set is the set that says yes to everything. So yeah, logic, logic and operations, which I'm hand waving the same geometry. Okay, so gonna need functor categories. We're only gonna need a small case of this, but I will just bamboozle you with this first. So what is a functor? So it's, a, it's the mapping between categories, which has to preserve the structure. So, um, so it's two parts. So, there's, so categories have objects and arrows. So we've got, first of all, we've, it's, it's just a function. 
from the object of C to the objects of D. Then we have what would be F map in, in Haskell. So if we've got a function, uh, uh, sorry, um, an arrow in the source category, we move, we, that has to become an arrow in, in the target category. And it, where it's gonna go between where its edges go. So, um, and we have to respect composition and divergence. Okay, so functors. Okay, and we need natural transformations. So, the, so these go are the things that go between functors. So, the way I like to imagine it is it's like a shadow puppets. So, you've got the category C and F is casting an image of that onto the wall. So the wall is D. So you get a possibly distorted image, but that's F's image. G casts another image, and the natural transformation uses the arrows in the target category to morph one into the other. Um, we are going to have an example in a, in a while, which will probably make this more sense, but um, you do just need to see this diagram. So don't worry if it, it's all a bit too much. So, uh, so here I've just listed the technical, how that works as a technical condition. So a natural transformation takes every object in that, that should be source category. Um, and it turns it into an arrow in the target category from FC to GC. But we also have the arrow part. So the two of them have to get along. So yeah, you have this, uh, these what are called naturality squares. Um, okay, this is all a bit abstract, but it'll make sense later. Um, so because we've got uh, functors and we've got something that goes between them, we now have all, all, all that we need to make a category. So, so, we, so we fix C and D, the, the objects of this functor category are the functors, and the morphisms are the natural transformations. Um, and all the, it just happens that this natural transformations are, um, the composition of these guys is, is associative, and there's an identity natural transformation that just gives you the identity for each object. Okay. Um, and we have special terminology. Um, so in so the special case of a functor where the, the target is the category of sets um, is called a pre-sheaf. And we, we customarily change the order of the arrows in the, in the source. Um, and not surprising, a category of pre-sheafs is called a pre-sheaf category. Okay, so this is a lot of terminology. Um, so I, yeah. I, 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 yeah, I hope the, the second part of the talk will be a little less overwhelming. Um, okay, so this is kind of cool thing. So any, so we can take any object in the source category and we can promote it to a, a pre-sheaf. Um, so how does that work? A pre-sheaf is, is something that takes, uh, has to go from some category reversed into a set. So it has to take every object and give you a set. So what is the set? It's the set of um, all the arrows from, from B into A. And then the, the F, map, F map part is just composition. Um, so this is, if you notice this, this is B to B prime here. And in, on the other side, we have B prime B. So this is a this is a direction reversing operation. So that that's what the op was doing. Okay. Um, okay. So let's see an example. So where let's look at the example. So not quite set, but one comma set. Um, so what what is this one? So one is this category. Um, it has one object. Uh, it has one morphism, which, I, which, I, which is from that thing to itself. So it's a, almost the simplest possible category. 
Um, and once again, wait, the name for that will be star. So what does this functor category look like? So its objects are functors from one to set. So what is a functor from one to set? So it has to take star to a set. So let's call that F star. So it's just a set. Um, and it has to take the identity morphism as the only morphism we've got um, on star to, but it has to take it to an identity morphism because that's part of the definition of functor. So it goes to the identity morphism on whatever set you chose. So it's just the same as a set. It's just, um, this, is, this is const, basically, if you like, on, on something. Um, and so a, a natural transformation is just an ordinary function. Okay, um, so, so we had the notion of a representable. What, so what are the representables here? So we get one from, we get them from promoting all the objects. Uh, there's one object, so there'll be one representable. So I'm gonna put a, uh, so that's yeah, one with an underscore. So it's a functor from one to set. Um, so it, remember the, de so the definition of a representable, it's all the objects, all the morphisms to that thing. Um, so, there's only one morphism to that, which is the identity. So this is just the set of the identity. Um, so it's a singleton set. Um, so turns out we, we're gonna be interested in sub objects of representables, um, just because. So, so this is, this is a one element, this is essentially a one element set. How, how many sub, subsets of the one element set are there? Um, there's two. So there's, um, there's the empty set and the thing itself. So, so we have two, yeah, the set of sub objects of one is, is a two element set. So we've kind of reproduced ball, which is interesting. Um, okay, um, right, so here I just explain what a subfunctor is. Uh, so basically every component should be a, should be a, uh, injective function for us. Okay, so now we're going to set that aside and look at graphs. So what is a graph? So, so you say it's, it's something like this. Um, you got nodes, you got edges, uh, edges go between nodes. Um, but maybe, maybe it's directed. Um, I'm not really sure. Um, maybe, maybe allowed multiple edges. Um, maybe allowed loops as well. Not sure. Um, maybe you can also put labels on the nodes. Um, so here I've labeled them with one, two or three, which I've drawn as colors. So we have, colored nodes, um, but obviously that could be anything. Um, maybe you put nodes on the edges too. So here I've just drawn some because um, I couldn't fit them. So we kind of got this whole um, smorgasbord of options for what a graph is. Um, and there'll always be some guy who says, what about hypergraphs? Um, so a hypergraph is like a notion where you say, Maybe edges don't have two nodes. Maybe they have one or three or 99. Um, and so another direction you can say is, so nodes are zero dimensional, uh, edges are one dimensional, but why stop there? Why not have uh, surfaces and volumes and keep going? So that takes you into the direction of this kind of uh, structured set. So you get simplicial sets, Globular sets, cubical sets, there's just kind of different ways of how you structure the, the basic shapes. Um, okay, but, so we, in the back of our mind, we've got category theory. So we're thinking, what, what are the mappings between these things? So, so in graph theory, we have the notion of a graph homomorphism. So 
you, you take nodes to nodes and edges to edges, but the nodes have to follow where the edges go. You can't just move an edge somewhere and then it's, it's source and target go somewhere else completely different. Um, so, uh, quick quiz, how, how many graph homomorphisms will there be from G to H? Yep, anyone just... <laughs> Six? <laughs> uh, so yeah, yeah, that's right, two. Um, so that you can even... So you kind of, if you just ignore, the, you can kind of ignore the nodes and just say the edge has to go either here or there, and then you check, well, the nodes are because they're forced by the edge. So two choices. Uh, what about now? Zero? Uh, no, there are actually, so, so it's going from G to H. Alex? <laughs> Sorry, I was waving to Hugh. Oh. He's about to leave. <laughs> yeah. Sorry. This is what I've had for the past 20 minutes, so yeah, it's made it a bit tough to follow. <laughs> See you later. Is it six? It is six. But, um, yeah, um, do you want to say why? Because uh, you can send the edge to either of the two edges. And then you have to do something with the node, and you have three choices, like the, the isolated node, and then you have three choices for that. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Um, what about now? Now zero. Yeah, zero, zero. Um, so the the edge has nowhere to go, so so you can't you can't do it. Um, there is there is a notion of degenerate homomorphism, which comes up in graph theory. So maybe you say. Sometimes we're allowed to squish an, an edge down to a node. So in that case, there'd be three for the edge and then three choices for the node. So then there'd be nine, I guess. Uh, but yeah, in generally zero. Okay, so let's re reboot, but thinking about categories. So, so Let's go back to graphs and explain it to me like I'm five. So I'm from Mars. I don't know what a graph is. Tell me. So, so I have two notions. There's edges and nodes. Um, so an, an edge is like an arrow and a node is like a dot. And your Martian says, I don't, I don't know where those are. Um, and you say, well, actually an edge has two nodes inside it. Um, and they're called source and target. So here you say we're putting that node into the edge twice. Um, and so your, your Martian says, I don't understand what you put inside the, the gray boxes, but the gist I got was you're talking about a category. So you have two objects, and node and edge, and we have two morphisms, source and target. So running, I'm gonna run with that and say, well, let's just make a category of graphs by making the functor category on that. So as, as we'll see, the idea of a functor category is you're going to take the basic shapes and paste together lots of copies of them. Um, and so that should give us all the graphs that we need. So these are the kind of uh, ground, like the basic plans of what, what, a, what can be in a graph. Um, so graph homomorphisms. Uh, first of all, first of all um, so let's spell out what that means. So, so a graph we've said is a is a pre-shift on curly G. So it's a functor from G op to set. So there were two two objects. So we're going to have so n goes to some set, e goes to some set. So this is our set of nodes, our set of edges. Um, so S went from N to E. So when we flip, it's we've got something that goes from the edges to the nodes. Um, and the same with the, with the image of T. So, so we have two functions from edges to nodes. I mean, I'm just going to abbreviate uh, and use little S and T for the images of those. So it's like normal source and target. So that's starting to look more like a graph. 
Um, so it's going to be directed, um, and we, it's going to have some uh, uh, so we've got no way of, of saying there are no model edges, there are no nodes, no loops. So we're just going to get those features, but we'll see what we can do with that. So what, what do the homomorphisms look like? So I had that um, natural transformation diagram before. So here we, we only have, so our source, um, our source category only has two non-identity arrows. So we're only get, we get two squares. So you've, you've got um, G's edges and G's nodes and you get source, source and target. Um, and the same for H. So when I translate, uh, that should be, that A there should be an E. So when I, so I try to translate an edge and get where it starts from, that should be the same thing as seeing where the edge starts from and then translating that. So this is the same, this is what we were saying before about graph homomorphisms that they, the nodes have to follow the edges. They said, now we've, we've just got it in a, um, equational form. Um, oh, by the way, is everyone following these commutative diagrams? Um, that just means every time you can go around the square from one place to another, that ha an equation has to hold. So we're saying if E is an edge, then uh, N of S of E has to equal S of N of E. And N of T of E, so the translating the target of the edge has to be the same, the same as the target of the translation of the edge. Okay. Um, yeah, so please stop me if you have questions. Um, so, do we have initial objects? Um, so, yes, we have the empty graph. No nodes, that should be an E, no edges. Um, no, yeah. So the same reason we had the absurd function, so we have the absurd graph homomorphism. Um, just works exactly the same. Um, and likewise, we have a terminal object. So uh, I should have drawn a picture here. So um, one node, one edge. So this is a loop. Um, um, and you can kind of see there's, so any, whatever graph, yeah, this really should have had a picture, but if I've got a graph here with some nodes and arrows, uh, nodes and edges, then all the edges have to go to the single edge in the loop. And that forces all, like all the nodes have only one place to go. And that you can see that the source and target are preserved. Like everything crashes down to one, one thing, but we're not breaking any edges when we do that. So what about points? Um, so it's a morphism from the terminal object to some other object. So, uh, so this is a loop. So a graph homomorphism from a loop to G is it finds, picks out a loop in G. So a graph that has no loops has no points, which is kind of interesting. Um, So, okay, and we have sums, so we just do the obvious thing. So uh, the nodes of G plus H are just, we just get the uh, disjoint union of all the nodes and the same with the, the edges. Um, uh, for some reason, I only wrote the source here, but this, so this is just by map in, in Haskell, by map on, on either, so we just, it's either an, a, one of G's edges or one of H edges, edges and then we just use the, the source. So we, uh, I should have had a picture here. So we're just putting two graphs side by side. Um, that's, that's all that's going on. Um, products are a bit harder to visualize. So we, uh, so we have, if we have an arrow times an arrow, you're gonna end up with a square graph. Um, that, that's the idea here. So um, once again, source and target are just by map S equals by map SS. 
t equals bimap cassette tt um, uh, so I'm skipping over this slightly because there's another part that I want to spend more time on um, uh, this is this one is a bit mind blowing um, so I'm not asking you to uh, understand this this takes quite a while to unpack but so we have the notion of graph homomorphisms from G to H and they actually form a graph, which is amazing and cool. So, and there's a there's a, just a recipe here. So how do you do it? So, you know, how we saw on the previous slide, how to make products. So you, you, so for the nodes of your, uh, function graph, uh, whatever we're going to call it. Um, uh, we, get the product of N and G and look at the graph homomorphisms from that to H. And we did the same things. Every time you, I changed my terminology. So every time you say an A, that's a miss, it's a typo for E. Um, cool. Uh, so what about, so this is gonna be more important. Uh, so representables. So we had two objects, N and E. So we're gonna have two representables. So uh, what does N look like? So what are its nodes? So these are going to, these are the morphisms in curly G from N to N. So N, N, N was just a dot, remember? So it, it only had, uh, it just had the identity morphism, nothing, S and T point uh, out of N. So there's nothing, there's nothing that goes to it. Um, so N of A, so there's nothing that goes, uh, so once again, that's E. Um, uh, let me go back. So, so there's nothing that goes from E to N. So that's that's the empty set. Right. Uh, so, so E is is a bit more interesting. So what are its nodes? So is this is a set as we know, and it's the morphisms from N to E. And there's two of them, uh, source and target. Uh, and what, what about the, the edges of E? Um, so there's the identity on E. Um, so I'm just, there's lots of abuses of notation in, the, in this field. So I'm adopting one here, which is for the identity on an object, we just use the name of the object. So the nodes of N is N, the set containing N, then the edges of E is the single set E. So now, now we know what these are, um, and we can work out the source and target for these. Um, so that happens with composition. So uh, there's, there's nothing to do here, but here the, the source of E is S and the target of E is T. So here's what they look like. Um, so this is interesting. So when we had before the gray boxes and I said I was ignoring what's inside the gray boxes, it, it didn't matter because we've magically reproduced them. Um, so this is kind of cool. Um, and this actually works in general. So even though we had that particular category curly G, I could do this with anything and you, you have something similar happen. So I, Okay, so you've, you've no doubt heard of the Uni Dilemma and it has this, so it's, this. So it's about, you've got a representable, you've got a pre-shift, so a graph. I can, the pre-shift will take an object and give you a set. But that, that, every element in that lines up one to one with the morphisms in the functor category from uh, C underline to X. So. Okay, that's all very abstract, but what does it mean for graphs? So, so, so we choose uh, this category C, C to be curly G. So we're saying for any graph, so C could be two things. It could be N or E. So if it's N, then we're saying the set of nodes is the same as a set of graph homomorphisms from N to X. Uh, so you think of a node, it, it's a, so a point was was a was a one to x, and we're saying a node is a is pointing out an a no, an n inside x. And the same thing happens with edges. So an edge 
in a graph is a uh, is pointing out an e in there. So it's a graph formalism from this graph, which is just one edge into 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 x, which is which makes sense, right? Um, so that's that's what when we had the example, but back here, that's exactly what you were doing. So you're kind of uh, here. So we had choosing choosing like the we had two morphisms here for the two edges. So uh, this is exactly as, the same as saying there are two edges of it. So we're just kind of rephrasing. So these are kind of in a sense more whoops, more interesting than than points at this stage. Um, okay, so what are the sub objects of the representables? So that's what we did before with the category one to set. We looked at the sub objects and we got bool. So what will happen here? So so n is a graph with just one node. So how many subgraphs are there? There's two. There's like the empty graph and n. So that's easy. What about e? So there's actually five subgraphs. So the full thing is a subgraph. So you have source, target, and and the edge itself. But maybe I maybe I don't include any of the node anything. So I have the empty the empty graph. Maybe I just include the source node. Maybe I just include the target. Maybe include both nodes, but not the edge. Or maybe include everything. So what are the so I'm gonna yeah, so what are the source and target of these? So um yeah, um so I'm just so this one doesn't have a source or a target. So the source is the empty the empty set of nodes, and so is the target. This one has the source, so the the, the source is n, the target is empty. This one just has the target, so we have empty set n. This has both, and this has both. Um, so yeah, we have a way for the source and target to act on sub objects. Um, yeah, so just hopefully that's more or less clear. Uh, it's a bit hand wavy. Um, so we can put this together to a picture. So um, so this is our last time we we did this. We turned the turned the wheel. And we came up with bool. This time we turned it and we came up with this graph. So this is bool for graphs. Um, so we have the two nodes, the, em the empty graph, the empty subset, and n, and we have our five uh, sub objects of E uh, with the source and target that we had on the, on the last slide. Um, so, and the claim is, uh, so I've used the scary word classify here. So, so we had predicates on set were a way of talking about subsets. Um, so now we have a generalized notion of predicate. So uh, a predicate is a function to, to this graph, sorry, a graph homomorphism to this graph, and that's gonna talk, classify subgraphs. Uh, so this is, you know, you go to your restaurant and what's on the menu? Oh, a delicious this, um, this is on the menu. Um, so, so how does this work? So I have omega down the bottom. That's just the customary letter for a generalized bool. Um, and we have uh, a graph at the top with a subgraph picked out. So the subgraph is these black nodes. Um, so this edge is not in it and these edges aren't in it. So how does this work? So the nodes are pretty pretty easy to work out. So they're either in it or they're not. So it's all in. Um, so the nodes that aren't go to zero. The nodes that are in it go to n. Um, so what about the arrows? So it turns out that there's different choices. So maybe a node is, uh, maybe an edge is completely not included. So this, this edge here 
um, goes to the empty uh, the empty set. Uh, this one is completely in, if you like. So it's included in the in the subgraph, and both its edges. Are, yeah, I mean, obviously, it's both its edges have to be. So it it goes to that again should be e. Um, now this one's interesting because it's the edge is out, but the uh, target is in. So this goes to the sub uh, subgraph I've called T, so which becomes an an edge on omega. And this one, the source is in, the target is not, so that becomes S. Um, and the, I, I called S plus T was this one that had the, the ed, S and T, but not not the edge. Um, so, th so this edge here, which which fits that pattern, so the it's terminals, if you like, a uh, source and target are, are in, but it's not in. So it, it maps to S plus T. Um, so hopefully you convince yourself that no matter what the subgraph, there's going to be a unique mapping onto omega. And vice versa, any time I tell you there's a graph homomorphism onto omega, you know I'm talking about a subset, and you can tell me which one it is. Very good. So that's, yeah, that's kind of cool. Um, so, uh, okay, so we, here we have, a, we have a check. So let's apply it to omega itself. Um, how many points are there in, in omega? Um, so a, a point is a loop, um, a mapping from the, the terminal graph into omega. So there's, there's one loop here, there's one loop here, there's one loop here. So there should be three points. Uh, and so a, a point is a mapping from one to omega, but mappings to omega correspond to subgraphs of the source. So how many subobjects does one have? Um, so you remember one is a loop. So it actually has three subgraphs. So it can be empty, it can be just the node, or it can be the node and the loop. The edge that goes from the node back to itself. Um, so this makes sense. Uh, um, so remember we were talking about predicates, we had the notion of a, um, all the things are mapped to true. So, so in this case, the, the loop A, so the point A, that's our notion of true. So, so that, that's true there. Uh, and there's more. So, um, so remember the, the power set was a set of all the subsets. So now we have a graph of all the subgraphs. Um, so how does that work? So we know uh, we know a homomorphism from G to omega is a subgraph of G, but we know how to put the graph homomorphisms from G to omega into a graph. Um, it's the function object. Um, so I'm not going to say it's going to be pretty, but you know you can do this, um, and it's cool. Um, and we also so remember that that connection between geometry and logic. So we could do this in bool. We could you know and and or and not and true and false. So we have the same thing here. So we have we have so I've said meet uh, instead of and. Um, because it doesn't, it's not exactly the same, but it, it's a similar thing. Uh, we have an or, we have an implies, we have a not, um, and we have other things. Um, so there's a whole lot of interesting stuff going on here because this has a lot more structure in it than bool. Um, yeah, so yeah, there's a lot to say there. Um, okay, so now we're kind of ready to talk about what is a topos. So a topos is, it's like a, convenient line in the sand. It's a, it's a set of useful properties that suddenly there's a lot of useful things you can do. So it's a category that has function objects. Uh, it has to have a sub object classifier. So it's equivalent of 
uh, bool, which is going to be some object omega. Um, and it's finitely complete. So this, so this means you've got products. Um, and there's another notion called an equalizer, which I haven't uh, explained. So it's a bit, it's like an equation. So, so in, uh, we, we can have like the set y equals x squared. It's like, so that's the equalizer between the identity function and the, the square function. Um, yeah. Um, uh, yeah, so what, what a topos lets you do is you've got, you can kind of pretty much everything you want to do in, you could do in set, you can just do that in your, in your category. So we can do all this stuff in the category of graphs because uh, every pre sheaf category is a topos. Um, so graphs are an example, but um, there's many, many examples. Um, okay, so going back to our other notions of graph. Um, yeah, and I should have added some pictures here. So we had the undirected graphs that we started with. So you might think, well, we, you're doomed. You can never do that here because you're starting with these categories which are always directed. You know, there's no, no notion of an undirected morphism. Um, but actually what you can do is you can say, well, I have nodes and source and target. Maybe every edge has another, uh, another edge. Oh, there should be another equation, i squared equals one. So maybe every edge has an equal and opposite edge. Um, this gives you something very, very close. Um, uh, you can do things like uh, reflexive graphs. So, so we have node, source, and target, and we have this R. So every edge, because uh, it goes from E to N. So when we, uh, in the pre sheaf category, it's going to go the other way. So this is every N, every node, we can turn into an edge. So this is, and we have here, SR equals one, TR equals one. So we're saying here that the, the source of that that reflexive edge on a node is uh, is the identity, and so it's a target. So it's a loop. Um, so every node comes with a loop. Um, so that so if every node have, comes with a loop, like you might as well not mention it. They, so the only difference is when we do graph homomorphisms, we get, that can be somewhere that an edge goes to. So, the, so now we've recovered the notion of a degenerate homomorphism between graphs. We, we can crush an edge down to a node. Um, and we can combine them, we can do both at once. Um, uh, if you wanted labels on the, on the nodes, then just add that to your, to your, to your uh, um, category. So yeah, so categories are like specifications here. Um, you kind of dream something up and then you say, now make the images of it in set. Um, and you can just, you know, actually reproduce a, a sizable chunk of, of graph theory. Uh, and we can put nodes on the edges instead. We can do both. Um, so we can do like these higher dimensional graphs is actually quite easy to do. So, so what I've got here is there's going to be an infinite set of um, types that generalize nodes and edges. So one dimensional cells, two dimensional cells, so on and so on. So uh, a two dimensional cell has two edges, it's a line. A three dimensional cell is a triangle, it has three sides. A three dimensional cell is a tetrahedron, it has four sides, and so on and so on and so on. Um, uh, you can do hypergraphs. So, so now we're gonna have one node type, but an infinite number of edge types or whatever you want. So, and so what we're saying here, remembering we reverse the arrows. So something in the set of N edges, um, we can talk about that the N different nodes that make up that. So, so they're actually, so they're ordered. Um, Cool. So yeah, we can recover hypergraphs. Uh, and we can do things like bipartite graphs. So here, the set of every edge 
uh, the source and target are in different different sets. Um, Bipartite. Um, and you might have realized I haven't so far covered the kind of simple graphs. So what if there are there's only one edge between two nodes at most? Um, and what do you do? Maybe you realize so we, we talked about the these uh, labels or attributes on nodes and edges. So the way I've I've done this, so every every graph will have its own set of nodes, its own set of edges, but also its own set of attributes. Um, but you probably you probably don't want that. You you want you know if you if you've got the nodes are black and white, then you, you're in the category where they're all black and white. Um, so it's actually not too much of a problem. So what you what you do is you just say, well, I just interested in the category where the node labels are such and such, or the edge labels are such and such. Um, and so that everything pretty much goes through as before, but you're actually not in a topos anymore. You're in a quasi topos. Um, so I said this was just a line in the sand. So this is a slightly different line in the sand. Um, so what changes is just the the notion of what omega classifies. Um, so instead of classifying all the sub objects, we have we have a a footnote there which is only strong sub objects. So what exactly that means is a there's a technical condition, and depending on what your source of yeah. Uh, uh, yeah, it'll be some stronger notion of, of what is allowed as a sub object. object. Um, and yeah, simple graphs. So we need, uh, we can do something oh, simple. Just, just on that, when you say um, a, a stronger notion of what's, what's allowed as a sub object, or a sub object, a sub object, is it just you're just distinguishing particular ones as being important? Like it's an arbitrary choice, modulo some modulo not breaking the logic like structure no no it's no it's a yeah it's it so it's a very uh it's what's called a it's a classifier for uh yeah strong sub object is a uh it's yeah so the monomorphism that so a mon so what is a sub object it's a uh do you have a picture for this later on um a sub object is like a equivalence class of monomorphisms so injective functions if you like and then so you uh yeah i'll, I'll show you the picture picture in a bit uh actually no, i'll just it's only here all right okay so here's, here's a subset so we've got this this big set and we say well the subset is d but we want to talk about that in terms of arrows so we say well it's an injective function from from something um and you say well if i had another one then that's it counts as the same thing as long as I can match the elements up one to one. And this round trip is the same as that round trip. Does that make sense? So then, then the so here we're allowing any any one to one function. So for a strong uh, sub object, you only allow strong monomorphisms, and there's a technical condition for those. So they have to be. Uh, orthogonal in a in a precise sense to to epimorphisms. Um, so we, yeah, you can write for a particular choice of of what the the target the source category is in your pre sheaf your notion of pre sheaf You can uh, get a more concrete idea of what that's going to look like. Um, so so in some cases it's going to mean yeah. Uh, the sub objects can't be connected by an edge or something or a particular edge. Um, uh, yeah, I'm, I don't really have a, a better answer at the moment. Um, maybe if I give another. That's talk. okay. It, it 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 still feels to me like that it's you can you you as long as you do the right thing, um, where the right thing are those technical conditions, then you you can designate like any sub you know, any any. any um, anything to be your strong um, uh, strong subset or whatever the correct terminology for it was I've forgotten it's a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a, once again it's a turn the handle thing so you feed in your definition of what what does a graph mean for you um, 
And yeah, then, which things do you care about? And then you make sure, and then you turn the handle to you know, to do the bits that you need to, and then you know, out pops. Okay, here's the appropriate definition at the other end. Yeah, that gives you what you wanted to say. Yeah, yeah uh, cool. And for simple graphs, we can use yeah. So you're gonna need a bit more of the uh, the topos theory stuff there. So there's um, so I talked about pre shifts. There's also a notion of a sheaf. So um, Uh, so, so the idea is that on the source category, you're putting a, a what's called a topology. So it's a way of saying kind of uh, how do you uh, how do you cover things? Um, um, no, I can't remember. I can't remember. I can't remember where I saw it recently, but this is an, a neat little listing of um, mathematical domains to the general notion that they study and the way that they described topology was the, the notion of being in the neighborhood of something. Mm, yeah. Yeah. So, so, so what happened, you know, if you have an arbor, if you allow arbitrary you know, definitions of what it means to be in the neighborhood of something, what doesn't change when you do that? Yeah. Yeah. So most of topless theory is not like pre sheaves are like a very special case. So a more general kind of situation, more classic would be, so just imagine you've got um, the Earth, and you've got a listing of an infinite listing of all the possible regions of the Earth, um, and then you have weather maps on those. So, um, so maybe you've got so just thinking about Europe. Say you've got you know map uh, weather on France, weather on Belgium, weather on Paris, weather on Luxembourg. Um, so the the pre sheaf part is saying, uh, I, if I know a one locality is contained inside a, a bigger one, I can, rest, I can get a map for this. So I can get a map of Paris by starting with a uh, weather map of France and just chopping out the bit I need. Um, so that's what. So we had S and T. So for in a, in a kind of something that's more shaped like a weather map those arrows are going to be moving uh, moving from Paris to France. So when you reverse it, you go from weather map on France to weather map on Paris. Um, and then the, the sheaf part is saying, well, I have um, different weather companies across Europe. So I have one in Belgium, one in France, one in Germany, one in Italy, so on, Hungary. Um, each one gives me a weather map with a bit of overlap. Um, and I know that all these different countries or regions together make up Europe. So as long as they agree on the overlaps, I can patch them together and make a global a weather map of all of Europe. So that's, that's the sheaf part. Um, so usually it's something this kind of continuous setting. Um, so it turns out for graphs, you can put topologies um, uh, on the um the um on the structure we talked about um so the, this is a kind of topology called a levier tourney topology um and so what that that will mean is a particular kind of pre sheaf uh, so not yet a sheaf but but uh, what's called a separated pre sheaf it will it's a way of saying topos theoretically there are no model edges um and then uh if you go so the full version of a sheaf, so a separated pre-sheaf is like halfway between normal pre-sheaf and a sheaf. So the full sheaf says every two nodes have one edge between them. So you've got, so it's the notion of a fully connected graph. Um, so a lot of the kind of everyday notions of graph theory just kind of pop out out of, out of the, uh, the theory. Um, cool, so that's all I've got. Um, so yeah, here's some some further reading. So this talk was pretty much um, pillaged from the, from this paper uh, and and this one by Olivia. Um, and these are some more kind of of the approachable literature. So yeah, Goldblatt is very nice. Um, kind of starts uh, quite basic. Um, oh, um, any questions?
There's one in the chat. Um, I'll let the person who put it up ask, or you can just read it, Mark. Let's see the chat at the moment. Um, see the chat. Well, maybe the person who put it up doesn't have the uh, isn't doesn't have their voice um, their microphone working. Um, the question was how's so how is a sheaf different from a fiber bundle? Ah, very good question. Um, yeah, so okay, I have a supplementary slide on the history, so I'll just I might go to that and then try to approach the question. Um, if you're okay with that. Um, so kind of topper theory came out of sheaf theory is, is a good way to say it. Um, and uh, sheaves are definitely related to fiber bundles. So the question is how are sheaves different from fiber bundles? So, so kind, of, kind of scene starts with Lorraine in 1945. So he's, um, he's been taken prisoner by the Nazis and he's in a concentration camp. Um, he's a mathematician who specializes in uh, fluid dynamics um, and he knows that if the Nazis know that they'll they'll put him to work in the war effort so he says no no I don't do anything useful I'm a topologist um, which is not quite a lie because he did a little bit of topology um, but not much so he in the concentration camp he sets up a little uh, university of sorts um, and ask people desperately ask people to send him topology papers um, so he has some contact, contracts contacts in Germany um, and so while he's in there he's in, in there for four or five years and he invents sheaf theory and also spectral sequences which are kind of two subfields of mathematics so which is amazing um, so he gets out and publishes um, so so sheaves, are, they're a way of talking about locally defined objects, like I was talking about with the weather maps. So he's interested in different partial differential equations that often have solutions in parts of the space, but not the whole space. Um, so then Henri Cartan has a seminar, and in 1948, Cartan and other people there kind of take his idea and kind of improve it a bit and end up with a modern idea of a sheaf. Um, then, Grotendieck uh, gets wind of this about 1955 and comes up with the idea of a pre-sheaf, which is this much simpler idea. Um, so he's kind of, it's a process of abstraction and simplification. Um, and right, so here's his student Vergier, and they, they start thinking about these things categorically in, in in this uh, seminar to geometry algebraic uh, in 1962. Um, and they published the lecture notes, um, notes from the seminar. Uh, and so here, here the, the kind of connection with bundles is kind of, it comes out of that, oh, I can't remember, someone else in that seminar. So the idea is a, a sheaf is very, there's another way of talking about sheaves, which is, um, a space sitting on top of your space. So a sheaf on some space, you've got another space sitting on top, which is locally, it's like lots of copies of that space. Um, so th this is what's called a, uh, there's a few different names in a tail space or a local homeomorphism for a, um, yeah, so th this is a particular case of a, uh, like a degenerate case of fiber bundle, I guess. So um, fiber bundle is a notion from, yeah, covering space, yeah. Um, so yeah, fiber bundle is, uh, how do I describe it? Uh, it's, a, it's an important notion from mathematics that also comes in uh, piece in physics. Um, uh, right, so this is, so at this stage, the, uh, we have the, uh, so when does it, the idea of a, a top has come up in this, um, 1962, but it's, it's linked to sheaves. So it's a very kind of concrete thing. We're thinking about something that sits over another space. Um, 
that space has been generalized, so it's no longer necessarily a topological space. So the, the idea, this was all for algebraic geometry, so they needed, uh, the topology they were using didn't, wasn't flexible enough. Um, so it's all, all do with polynomials. Uh, so polynomials don't have a good notion of neighborhood. So you're kind of at a point, or then you're all the space. Um, uh, uh, and then, so Levere Levere and uh, Turney in 1962, they kind of made the notion of an elementary topos, which is what we call now topos, which is just this notion of uh, sub-object classifier um, limits and um, Cartesian closed. Um, so here this, yeah, so, um, that's now in some sense the, the main notion in, in much mathematics. Um, I hope that answered the question. Um, then after that, there was a whole lot of, it suddenly gets uh, um, a whole lot of connections start to, start to between, appear between set theory and topos theory and uh, proof theory. So there's a notion of uh, forcing in, in set theory. So this is the, you might've heard that um, the question came up in, in, in set theory, uh, it's so it was proved it works so, yeah uh the question is how is the axiom of choice connected to the rest of set theory um so cohen worked out this technique called forcing and he said it works with it it works it without it and that was actually quite hard to prove um people then levier and tini looked at his proof and realized that was an example of a uh, kind of topos theoretical phenomenon um and then it's yeah, kind of expanded into programming languages. So programming lang language semantics um, uh, and proof theory use a lot of topos theory. So the, the thing to look up is the uh, realizability topos and the effective topos. Um, uh, so please go read about them and then explain them to me. Um, I don't understand them. Uh, so I think that really is about all I've got. Um, Cool. Um, if there's no other questions, well, let's thank Mark for the great talk. Yeah, thanks, Mark. Yeah, thank the, you um, very much, Mark. That graph classifier was thanks, uh, surprisingly cool to look at. <laughs>